I hope my notes are accurate too, Dave. I feel like you're doing so many things that it's hard to keep track. <laughs> it is. I have trouble. <laughs> okay. And I want to see if I can quickly share this before we start. Oh, I can admit Sarah because I'm a co-host. I'm going to let there her in. There you go. Okay? Feel free. Wonderful. All right, she's in. That helps me out. <laughs> There we are. Um, hey, Emily, Megan, Sarah, you can turn on your videos, I think. Can they? Yeah. They, they can if they want to. And if you want to. Just making sure the live. Okay, it's up now. So I'm just going to share it to Fifth Street if it lets me. Oh, I can see myself talking and it's really delayed. It's funny. Um, Okay, let's just see. Share to a page. Okay, okay. there we go. Okay, I'm just doing a quick share and then I'll get started. Are we good to go? Yeah. No, oh, we can we can see the youth center now. Okay. There they are. I've never actually been there, so hi. Hi, youth center. <laughs> Those are some fun colors. Okay. So let's get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first event of the Literacy Live series, a program funded by the town of Collingwood and Experience Simcoe. My name is Jennifer Murley, and I'm here on behalf of Fifth Street Creative Initiatives a Collingwood-based charity that brings free cultural learning opportunities to youth and families. From violin lessons to symposiums and workshops, Fifth Street is here to bring people together to learn, create, and share their creativity with others. Along with our project partners, the Collingwood Public Library, Caitlin, if you wanna give a little wave, um, the Collingwood Youth Center, I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Toronto-based writer and community organizer, Dave Meslin. I've had the pleasure of working with Dave in various capacities across Simcoe County, starting conversations about Canada's broken electoral system, voter apathy, and making change in the communities where you live, which is why we're all here tonight. Dave is known for organizing community action in non-traditional ways whether that's picking up a paintbrush and painting personality to his neighborhood streets or using Lego to deconstruct our voting system, his goal is always to communicate that people have the power to change communities and that we're stronger and smarter when we're all involved. Dave is a part of Unlock Democracy Canada and wrote the book, Tear Down, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. More recently, Dave has taught free crash courses about voting systems and was the brains behind the Ninth Line Kite Festival that took place in Grey Highlands this past September with over 2,000 participants. With all of that said, I'd like to turn it over to Dave. Welcome and thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Jen. Hello to everyone on the Zoom call. Hello to everyone on Facebook and hello to anyone who might be watching this later on YouTube. I'm totally excited. It's really weird doing Zoom events. I love public speaking, but it's usually in front of actual humans and you can like see other faces and you can all laugh together. But here we are, it's 2021, staring at my laptop. I know, I know you're all there though. Um, okay, I wanna tell you about so many really exciting things. Um, and I'm gonna try and cram a whole bunch of stuff into an hour. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. If you want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. Um, this can be kind of a back and forth dialogue. You can interrupt. If I, if I say something that confuses you, you can ask me for, cl for clarification. You can wave plastic bags at me. I don't know what's going on there at the youth center. You can, you can keep doing that. Um, so one thing I want to spend a bit of time talking about is that I'm, run I'm running a national campaign to lower the voting age to 16. And I'm really excited about that. Hands up if you support that. Amazing, one, two, one of you isn't quite sure, um, but oh wait, okay, one of you still isn't sure, uh, but that's pretty good, four out of five. Okay, everyone's into it, amazing. 
So how many of you are, I can't tell how old you are. How many of you are under 18? Okay, amazing. So none of you voted um, at the September election, which was a month ago. I think that's personally ridiculous. I would lower the voting age even lower than 16, but one thing I've learned about politics is that change happens in, in little baby steps. Um, I actually think that you should get a full vote when you're like 10, and then you should lose a percent of that vote every year until you're 110, and then your vote is worth zero. So, cause I'm 47, so I'm half dead. So I should get like half a vote because the decisions we're making today about the environment are gonna affect me for like 40 years max, my parents for sadly probably about 10 years, but they're gonna affect teenagers for you know the next 70 years. So I think they should actually get a bigger vote. But at a minimum, we have to create a situation where all 16 and 70 year olds are able to vote municipally, provincially and federally. So I wanna tell you a bit about that campaign. I wanna tell you how it's going and I wanna tell you how you can get involved and make a real difference because we're doing it for teenagers but most importantly, we want teenagers actually running the campaign. And we have visibility. We have, we're on um, Instagram, we're on um, TikTok, and we're on Discord. And we definitely need help with those platforms because I don't speak the lingo, nor should I. It's not my scene. Um, okay, so I want to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about other ways where you can get involved and actually make a real difference. So, um, do, 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 feels free to interrupt, blah, blah, blah. Great, awesome, thanks, Jen. Okay, so first of all, quick clarification on how Jen introduced me. I actually live half time in Toronto and half time in Eugenia, which is just on the other side of the Blue Mountains. So if you were to go up the Blue Mountains and then toboggan down the other side really fast and then slide for about 10 more kilometers, you'd be where I am, near uh, Flesherton in Grey Highlands. Um, if you went further, you'd end up in the Beaver Valley down by Kimberley. But if you stopped halfway, you'd probably, you'd probably be able to, to be where I am. Um, so I'm kind of a neighbor, and I drive through Collingwood all the time, and I'm a fan. So I want to just talk about general activism for about five minutes. I've been doing political organizing and activism my whole life. Like I said, I'm 47, and I know a lot of younger people are engaged in politics, but for me, the hard part was trying to figure out, you know, as I got older, you know, can I still be an activist? Is there room for everyone? And I've learned that you can spend your whole life making a difference as a political activist. And it definitely changes its tone and shape as you go through different phases of life. But there's been really fun ways to engage at every age. Um, and I'd say that some of my most fun activism was actually when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. Um, as Jen mentioned, sometimes it's about picking up um, a paintbrush and actually changing things physically. So for example, when it comes to installing bike lanes, I'm a big cycling advocate and I've been trying to get better bicycle infrastructure my whole life um, for, for lots of different places. And the way I do that now is I participate in lobbying and I participate in advocacy and research and speaking at committee meetings. Um, but when I was younger, it literally meant picking up some white paint and just getting a paintbrush and painting a bike lane. And both types of activism are equally important. We only use chalk, of course. They weren't, it wasn't real paint. Um, it was, these were temporary chalk bike lanes, but sometimes Sometimes you have to take, you know, what's called direct action um, to be heard. And sometimes you have to do the research and dress up nice and speak at a committee meeting. And of course, there's lots of space in between as well. And what I've learned is that you can do kind of all of that at the same time. And I'll just share a quick example. I've been working on a campaign in Toronto for 20 years to get a bunch of corporate billboards taken down. And that's an important issue to me because I just feel like public spaces should reflect the people who live there, right? So we all decorate our bedrooms in a way that defines who we are. If I went into any of your bedrooms or even your kitchen maybe or your living room, but if you're, if you're still at home with your parents, we'll just use the bedroom example because that's like one space that we all have some level of control over. And what I'd find is that there might be posters up or artwork 
There might be framed photos of your friends or family. And each of those things would tell me something about you. And our neighborhoods, I think, should feel the same way. When I go down your main street or go to your parks or, go, or walk down your alleyways, I should see things that should see things that make help me learn about the people who live there. And the people who live there, more importantly, should see themselves reflected back. Graffiti is a great way to do this because graffiti is always made by some someone local with a can of spray paint. Now it's better to get permission to do it. You, you'd be surprised how willing property owners will be to get commissioned artwork, especially behind a building. Because everyone knows that graffiti artists and taggers, I mean, they break the law, but they have a bit of a code of conduct and they don't tend to go over other people's art. So if I own a building and people keep doing like random graffiti on the back of my building, and then a group of teens come up to me and say, hey, do you want us to actually do something nice? The reason all this work is ugly is because we're sneaking around at night, we're doing it quick, we're looking over our back and we're running away. If you'll just like give us 200 bucks to buy some spray paint, we'll show you some designs and we'll do something really nice. A lot of business owners will be like, oh my God, that would be great because it'll cover up what's there and people won't do graffiti over it because it'll look good. And it gives you, um, you know, more time to do nicer art um, and not go to jail. All these things are great. Um, what was my point? Well, my point is commercial billboards are the opposite. So commercial billboards would be like me walking into your bedroom and putting up something that I want for me, right? It's like, I wanna promote my book. This is the book I wrote, Tear Down. So I'm gonna print a poster of it like four feet wide, six feet high and go into your bedroom and tape it to your wall, right? So if I did that, you'd be like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I love your book, but this is my room. This isn't appropriate. And that's how I feel about every Tim Hortons, Nike, Chevrolet, whatever, you name it, billboard in a, in a residential neighborhood. In, in, in my book, I, I have a picture of, um, let me see if I could find it quickly. I have a picture of a billboard urinating um, on the ground. <laughs> and that's because dogs mark their territory. Give me a second here by urinating on a whatever, here we go. I don't know if you can see the, there we go. Can you see the line, the urine line? So es es essentially we mark our territory by putting up things around us that reflect who we are and corporations mark their territory by putting up billboards. So anyways, I've been working on this campaign in Toronto, trying to get illegal billboards taken down. A lot of these billboards, they don't even have permits. These companies just throw them up. They treat our space as if it's their backyard. It's also really like, how would I describe it? Monoculture, right? So every one of these billboards is straight. They're all like, I don't know, 25, 30 years old. Um, none of them have a disability. None of them wear any kind of ethnic or religious garb. They're always in English. They're just boring. They're just stale. They're just cookie cutter. And the Tim Hortons billboard in your neighborhood is the same Tim Hortons billboard up in my neighborhood. It's like the opposite of anything that's unique or interesting. So this campaign has taken on different um, elements. So a political campaign is like playing chess. You have to understand the chessboard. Who are all the different players? You've got corporate lobbyists, you've got city councilors, you've got a mayor, you've got political staff, you've got um, the bureaucracy, right? All the um, administrative people behind the scenes. You have provincial regulations, municipal, you have journalists, um, and you have all these bylaws and rules. And all these pieces are like levers that you can pull. It's kind of like, it's like a video game. It's like working with redstone in Minecraft and you can create circuits. And if you know how every piece works, you can make these circuits that actually function. Um, so my point was um, diversity of tactics. So on the one hand, I'm doing all this research into whether or not these billboards actually have permits. And I've had to go into the city's archives and like pour through all these old records. I've had to do freedom of information requests, which is when a government doesn't feel like sharing information that should really be pu publicly accessible. You can actually file a form that says, okay, I really want to see it. And for some reason, if you fill out the form and pay five bucks, they'll show you anything. 
but they just make you go through this extra hoop, which is so stupid because this is public information that we actually pay for, um, but they won't show it to you unless you fill out a form. Anyway, so I've been doing a lot of that, but a few weeks ago, I got really angry because um, these billboards that I know are illegal and I've proven repeatedly are illegal, they're still up. So I wrote a notice of violation, which usually is like a piece of paper about like, you know, this size. And it says notice of violation and you stick it on a building, like a building in, 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 in inspector would put it on a library, for example, if the library wasn't up to code. If um, Jen's library had bad, bad wiring, you might get a notice of violation or if you put out too many bags of garbage. So I put a notice of violation on the billboard and I wanted to make sure that people actually really noticed it and the billboard company really noticed it. So I made sure that it was really large. Here you can see it. So these are each six feet by 16 feet and I made them at Staples. I'm gonna try and play a video. Can you guys see this video right here? Okay, hold on a second. You might not hear it, but let's try. That's at, that's at Staples. Anyways, that was fun. Um, so two funny things about that. One is, first of all, we didn't vandalize anything. That was taped on top of the sign with temporary painter's tape, right? So we could be charged with mischief or trespassing, I guess. Um, but I can tell you that no progressive social change has ever happened in the history of humanity without someone not breaking the law, but dancing around the gray edges of it in a peaceful way. That's the whole beauty of civil disobedience. But we went out of our way to not damage the sign. We didn't paint on the sign. We used temporary tape and put our sign on top of theirs. But the other fun thing was we did it in the middle of the day. We just dressed up as workers. So usually you would think that if you're going to do a billboard liberation or billboard alteration, you'd have to like sneak around at night. Um, we just put on reflective vests and had pylons and ladders. And I had a hard hat on, which actually was a soft hat. I bought it for $2 at Dollarama. It was a Halloween costume, but it looked like a construction worker's hat. Um, and we got tons of media out of it. We were on CBC, we, had, we were on television, we were on the radio and it got our message out. And now the city councilor has asked city staff to look into it. And we have a big meeting set up this week to actually find out if the signs can get taken down. But it was this really fun, like, it's been a long campaign and it was a lot of administrative research work, which is fun. Oh, I wish the volume was on. You're playing a song. Are you serenading us? <laughs> um, there should be backup music the whole time. Is that a ukulele or a guitar? Just hold up four, four strings or six? Four, it's a uke. All right, or it's a bass, either way. Um, anyways, we are going to get those billboards taken down. And what I'm trying to do, actually, it's not just about removing billboards. I want that space reclaimed for public art. I think every high school should have spaces and spaces on the streets for art classes to put up their own work. Like we all have like kids art up on our fridges. We should have like massive versions of fridges, but for high schools. So I think all the billboards should be turned into museums, or not museums, art galleries for local elementary schools and high schools. So it's not about having like sterile public spaces without billboards. It's about having billboards and signs and art that is an accurate reflection of the diversity of people who actually live there, of people of all ages. So let's talk about lower the voting age. You all said you agree we should lower the voting age. And this is kind of a no brainer really. So I want to show you a campaign I'm working on. I'm going to share my screen again. Do, 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 How does this work? 
Don't laugh at me for not knowing how to share my screen. Okay, check this out. This is vote16canada.org. And this is a national campaign. We have links on here to Instagram, Twitter in both languages, Facebook, Discord, um, uh, sorry, in, uh, TikTok and Discord. And what we're trying to do is create change all across the country. We have a map here and you can click on any province um, Manitoba, what's happening? Well, someone started a blog in Manitoba. Okay, not a lot happening there. Let's look at PEI, even though it's really, really tiny and hard to click on. Can I get it? PEI, PEI. Why do they make PEI so small? What are you thinking? Look at all this, tons of stuff. Green MLA, so they don't call, they don't, we, we call them MPPs in Ontario member of provincial parliament, they call them MLAs, member of the legislative assembly. Someone introduced a bill to actually lower the voting age. So there is stuff happening. And federally, this is actually really cool. I'm trying to get to my navigation here. Do, 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 learn more. Check this out. These are all the members of the federal, in, in, in Ottawa, in the Senate and in the House of Commons who have put forward bills to lower the voting age. So you, you probably didn't even know this was happening. There was a bill in the Senate, S-209, to lower the voting age to 16. Here's a member of the, of the Senate, Mary Lou McFedrin, who thinks it's so important to lower the voting age as she put forward her own bill. Elizabeth May put forward two bills so far to lower the voting age. Don Davies has done it one, two, four times. He's from the NDP. Mark Holland did it as a liberal, and had a supporter from the NDP, the Bloc, and the Conservatives. So this has been going on and on since uh, 2001. So for 20, wow, for 20 years, there's been members of the House of Commons who are trying to lower the voting age to 16. And the way we're doing it right now is we're trying to get uh, political parties all across the country to commit to lowering the voting age provincially or federally. Um, but guess what? There's only one federal government, although it has two houses, There's one federal government, because uh, only one of them is kind of a real elected house. Um, there's only 10 provincial governments, but there's like 5,000 city halls in Canada. So what we're trying to do is find municipalities that might lower their voting age, because a lot of um, change starts at the local level. If you look at when women got the right to vote, you'll find that they got the right to vote federally, like I forget what it was, 1920 or something, 1925. But a few years before that, women had already won the right to vote in a whole bunch of provinces, actually uh, towards, towards the Western part of the country. I think Saskatchewan was first and then Manitoba and Alberta. Uh, but before that, like 10 years before that, women were voting in local city elections um, all across the country. So I think we can get the voting age lowered to 16 in a place like, I don't know, Collingwood, right? Who knows? Maybe. Now, it's a little complicated because right now, I don't know if the province would allow a city to lower the voting age. This, the local elections are really highly regulated by the province. Um, but they could ask, so what would happen if you've got, I think about 10, let's look, I think I have them here. Do, 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 do I have them? Do I? Town council. Here we go. Look at these people. I don't know who these people are. You should know who they are. Share screen. Here we go. Look at these people. Look at them. First of all, you have a majority of women. Amazing. Very rare for city council. City councils, first of all, Canada ranks like 60th in the world for having crappy gender balance in our House of Commons. Um, it's about just over 25% right now. I don't, I don't think we're at 30% yet, uh, but municipalities are even worse. Like Pickering is all dudes, the entire council, all dudes. So this is actually pretty cool. Who are these people? Brian, Keith, Steve, Tina, Deb, Yvonne, Kathy, Bob, Marianne, amazing. Do you think one of them would put forward a motion to lower the voting age to 16 in Collingwood? Maybe, maybe not, it'd be worth asking. You could literally phone these people up. And this is what I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about. 
we're we don't, we don't first of all we don't get taught civics well at we don't, we don't first of all we don't get taught civics well at all in school which isn't anyone's fault in particular but most kids come out of high school pretty clueless about civics because most of your civics teachers are also clueless and most adults in general are pretty clueless about politics um, so it's just this never ending cycle of cluelessness which gives a real advantage to anyone who just learns how the system works and tries to get involved. Um, so most of my work focuses on municipal activism. And by municipal, that just means like working with city councils and mayors and city councilors, rather than trying to convince my member of parliament to do something. And I'll tell you why, there's two main reasons. And I really want to encourage you in Collingwood to like, or wherever you're watching from to plug into what's happening locally because whether you're interested in environmental change and um or you know climate policy or lgbt issues or the wealth gap between the you know richest one percent and everyone else or whatever every level of government affects those issues and the place where you can make the most difference is locally with your city council. And there's two reasons. I mean, there's more, but I'm gonna focus on two. One is that it's just the closest, right? Um, and it's the smallest. So your MP of your federal riding represents 116,000 people. So imagine that's your job, right? I'm Megan Burns. I represent 116,000 people. And one of them phones you up. It's like, hey, I, got, I wanna talk about something. Um, chances are you might be too busy <laughs> to, to meet with them. Whereas your city council, the entire council, the whole thing is like, what, 20,000? You know, it's, it's just, it's a lot smaller. So towns are just smaller than ridings, which means everything is more accessible and local. And they're more likely to know you or know someone who knows you, or you might bump into your city councilors at the grocery store. It's just, it's just a small, it's a smaller local vibe. All right. Um, but the main thing is provincially and federally, right? So we have the provincial government of Ontario in Toronto at Queen's Park in the legislature. We have the House of Commons in Ottawa. Those are both run by political parties. And one thing that political parties do very well in Canada, better than any other Westminster British inspired democracy is they're really good at, at getting all the members of their caucus to be obedient. <laughs> we have the highest level of partisan obedience than Australia, UK, New Zealand, you name it. And what does that mean? It means that if Emily Wilson gets elected as MP of her riding, she actually can't really do much because whether she's elected as a liberal or an NDP or a green or whatever, well, let's leave the greens out of it. They're so small that I, I don't know how much discipline they have. I mean, I think they're down to, oh, they're down to two. Um, but with the other major parties, they have what's called a party whip. So let's say Elaine is the party whip. So Elaine will phone Emily and say, hey, Emily, um, we've got a vote coming up tomorrow on the liberal budget. Um, we're voting no, or we're voting yes. And you, you have to do it. So the point is that you can lobby your MP and your MPP, they might meet with you, but even if you actually persuade them to support you on, let's say lowering the voting age, you could contact your, M your MP, and he or she might be like, oh yeah, you're totally right. We should lower the voting age. Guess what? There's not much they could do. They could put forward a private member's bill, but even that would be difficult. Whereas if you have coffee with the city councilor and you bring them on board, they can literally move a motion the next week. They don't have to ask anyone. No one whips their vote. They have no allegiance to anyone. Um, it's just a whole different ball game. So, Local elections are where it's at. Local politics are where it's at. And if you do, do learn anything in civics about those three levels, you'll probably be taught the exact opposite. We, we use the word like higher level of government to describe provincial, 
pr provincial is higher than municipal and federal is higher than provincial, but it's kind of the exact opposite. All cool stuff kind of starts locally. Um, and I would say at this point that cities actually, city councils or town councils affect our daily lives just as much as provincial and federal, if not more. So they, they don't just name the streets and put up stop signs and make sure the garbage gets picked up. They make huge decisions about local policing, about how we build our neighborhoods, about schools, about daycares, drug policy, things like safe injection sites and harm reduction, um, rules about sex work, you know, the, the sex trade, which is like a huge issue for many marginalized people who end up in that work. And there's tons of advocacy around that issue of how to reduce harm to people who have either made that choice to go into that line of work or have ended up in it against their will. And how do you get them out of it? And they're like, a lot of this stuff is affected by town councils who regulate things through bylaws. It's not just federal um, pieces of legislation. Local bylaws affect you every day. Your parks, your roads, your sidewalks, public transportation. That's all local, which again is a huge social justice issue. People who don't own cars still have to get around. How do they do it? And that's a, that's a huge issue, especially in smaller towns where you don't have you know, subways and, and, and streetcars. Elaine, if as an adult, I find this confusing, we need to ensure our youth are educated and getting their voice heard. Absolutely. It's the funniest thing. Hello, whoever's waving at me, CYC, um, Collingwood Youth Center. Maybe, all right, um, absolutely. I think one of the biggest myths is that, is this, this idea that, that adults are like engaged and aware about politics. So sometimes I'll talk to teenagers and they're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to vote because I don't really know a lot about politics. And I was I'm like, well, neither does your mom or your dad, trust me. Um, so, and it's not a prerequisite. Like it's never been a prerequisite of you that you have to know about politics to vote. Otherwise, most adults wouldn't be allowed to vote. Um, Emily, yeah, isn't that crazy? So not only that, you know, it's really changed in the last 20 or 30 years too. There's been a lot of called what's called downloading, where things that used to be run by the province or the federal government has actually been passed down to local government. <clears throat> so like 30 years ago, the level of progression in politics was you would start as a trustee and then become a counselor and then you'd run provincially and then federal and right now we actually often see people going the other direction so the mayor of Brampton right now Patrick Brown he was the leader of the Ontario provincial conservatives the brand new mayor of Edmonton was a cabinet minister in Ottawa last year right so the highest level of government I think right now in lots of ways is actually municipal also, if any of you want to run for office, and you all should try it at some point, as soon as you're 18, you don't just get to vote, you get to run. If any of you are 18, by next October, you can run for city councilor in Collingwood. There should totally be some youth candidates representing youth issues, even if you're just doing it to, to get your voice heard. Um, it's hard as a youth to get your voice heard, right? That's why they march out of their schools and do you know, climate strikes and protests. One great way to be heard is go to City Hall in May and say, I want to run for city council. Where's a nomination form? They'll say, well, you need to pay 100 bucks, fill out this form. Boom. Your name is now on the ballot. You're being invited to all candidates debates. Um, you're getting time on the local TV station. You could totally do it. Anyways, what was my point? That was like a tangent off a tangent off a tangent. Um, okay, the other part though of any campaign is knowing your information. It's becoming an expert in the field because you can't be persuasive unless you've done your homework. You can't bring on allies and stakeholders unless you've done your homework. Um, and you won't be able to convince politicians. So one of the first things you wanna do on any issue is like, Google the hell out of it. Just like spend out, become a geek, embrace the idea of being a total nerd on whatever your topic is. And don't try and like save the world. Don't try and stop climate change. Pick one really, really specific small thing 
and try and change that. And that way you can become a leading expert on it. And the media will come to you for interviews and people will come to you for expert advice. Um, counselors under 40, forget that. Counselors under 20, let's do this. Um, why not? Like just run, just, just run for office, folks. Um, oh, what I was saying before is if you want to run provincially or federally, that's very hard unless you want to do it as an independent, which is almost impossible. I mean, you can, but it's weird. Um, but it'd be really hard as a 17 year old, sorry, 18 year old to win the NDP nomination or the liberal nomination, the conservative nomination, but no one can stop you from running for city council. And every city councilor is an independent. So you're on a level playing field. If you run as an independent in the next provincial election, which is next June, you can do it, but they'll be like, you know, some like fancy schmancy liberal and NDP and conservative, but everyone in a municipal election is an independent. So you're all just, your names are just alphabetical on the ballot. No one, no one says liberal, conservative or anything. So do it. High five from Jen or high 10. Um, so I'll give you some examples. So I've been trying to change the voting system in Canada and I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. But one of the ways that I've been successful at doing that is by having a lot of data. So I can point to, you know, which cities are already doing it, right? Um, how it improved things, how it improved gender balance. Um, having statistics on the tip of your tongue is really helpful way to be a, an advocate and to be a policy leader and, and an activist. So for vote 16, you know, it's good to know what the counter arguments are and then what the counter counter arguments are. So when someone gives you a counter argument, you've already heard it before, you've thought about it through, and you know what the response is. And that way, if you're doing an interview, um, you'll sound really smart and prepared. So for example, one classic argument is um, the teenage brain scientifically isn't fully formed yet, um, which is funny because I'm 47 and I, I don't know if my brain is fully formed yet or if it ever will be. But if that's going to come up and it will, do your research. And what you'll find is, is that the studies about brain formation are actually really complex and really interesting. And one of the things they found is that there's a distinction between cold cognition and hot cognition. So there's decisions we make that are like really spontaneous in the moment, like boom, um, oh, you're kind of drunk, should you get in the car? Or, oh, your friend's kind of drunk, they're getting in the car, should you go with? Oh, someone's offering you a drug that you're not sure about, should you take it? And yeah, there is evidence that at 16 to 17, you're less likely to make a good decision about those things than when you're 30 or 40. And I can tell you from my memory of driving a vehicle in my teens, I was stupid. I did stupid things. I drove too fast and I used to like weave in and out of the lanes like it was some kind of video game. But there's a different type of cognition, which is when you're faced with a, um, a complex decision that involves lots of facts and you have time to think about it. And it's not like an in the moment spontaneous decision that could be influenced by peer pressure or, hor or hormones or whatever. Um, when it comes to that type of slow processing, 16 and 17 year olds have the exact same brain as anyone else. They can, there's just, there's just no difference. They can totally do it. So should 16 year olds be driving? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, should they be voting based on existing science? Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. The science is so solid on this. Um, but we were already letting teens do tons of really important, um, high stakes decision making. We do let them drive cars. We, you can join the reserves and literally learn how to use a gun. You can, you can get married. You can offer sexual consent to adults, which is actually really kind of gross if you think about it. You can have sex with the mayor, but you can't vote for the mayor. That's just weird. That's actually because because who made these rules, right? Mayors and like politicians. So it actually starts to get kind of creepy that all these old men are like, 
Oh yeah, they're not old enough to vote yet, but uh, oh yeah, sex, totally. They're, they're ready. Gross. So it's just a matter of like catching up. Like let's, let's make this, let's make this consistent. Um, but here's something else too. Like one of the ways that we originally fought for voting rights, like, you know, back in the day, um, all of us, um, first it was like male property owners, but eventually it grew and grew. But one of the main arguments in the first place for why anyone should vote is that we pay taxes, right? So if you're gonna be, if there's gonna be some like government thing that's taking my money and then spending it, I, I shouldn't I have some say about how the money gets spent. And by age 16, you're totally paying taxes. Probably not income tax. I mean, you're probably making money, but not enough to really pay much income tax. But if you're making a few thousand a year, babysitting or a summer job, or you're a famous YouTuber, um, you're spending that money. And when you spend money, you're paying sales tax. So either we should give complete sales tax exemption to all 16 and 17 year olds, which wouldn't work because then all their parents will be like, can you buy me a TV? Can you buy me a car? And like, they'll be like just transferring all their money to their kids. Um, or we should just let them vote. But here's the main reason. And this is important because it's the most, I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the reason that motivates me, but also I think it's the most convincing reason if you're pitching this to a city councilor or, or an in, you're doing an interview or whatever, there is a lot of evidence, scientific evidence, that shows that we develop voting habits at an early age. And what that means is if you don't vote in your first election when you're old enough to vote, then you've developed a self-identity as a non-voter. And if you don't vote in your first two elections, you've really, you've really created a habit of not voting. An election is something you hear about, you know about, you might read about the results the day after, but I don't, I'm not one of those people who votes. And you take that habit with you into your adult life. And voter turnout amongst adults is very low. Um, in, the, in the last couple of elections, we've reached the mid 60s in terms of percent, so like 65, 66%. And that was considered really high, which means like one out of every three adults just completely skipped out. And we were like, oh, this is great. This is, you know, a high level. Um, but the opposite is equally true. If you vote in your first election, the first time you're able to, you now self-identify as a voter. And the next time an election comes around, you're gonna vote because that's what you do. And if you vote in two elections, you've really solidified that habit. You're now entering a lifelong trend of voting, provincially, municipally, federally. So let's look at what ages you're most likely to vote and which ages you're least likely to vote for your first time. So, um, and sorry, that's my 16 year old son texting me. So I have a 16 year old son <laughs> who's crazy smart, totally ready to vote. We actually run a business together we fabricate and install personal bike parking in people's front yards. And we actually get all of our bike racks powder coated in Collingwood. Um, interesting tidbit. So um, he's making, he made 5,000 bucks this summer installing bike racks with me and he's gonna get taxed on that. Anyways, what was I saying? He just texted me and it threw me off. Jen, what was I talking about? I honestly forgot. Um, well, now I feel thrown off too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Habit forming, habit forming. So at age 16 and 17, you're in, you're in high school. You're in the home you grew up in. You're in the neighborhood you grew up in, the city you grew up in, um, living with your parents, and you're taking civics in high school. That is an amazing time to introduce people to voting and say, okay, you're old enough to vote now. You're earning money, you're spending money. Um, we want your civics class to be meaningful. So, hey, there's an election next year, you can vote. The chance of people in that age bracket of voting is astronomical. It would be close to 100 um, because you'd be probably, your local voting booth is probably at your school, right? Your parents would actually have pressure to like take you there, which would actually boost their voter turnout as well. Um, your name is likely to be on the voters list because um, your parents would have added you or maybe there's something through your school. Well, 
where like your whole grade gets added, whatever. And then you're now a voter. You, you've like, you self-identify as a voter. Okay, now let's go to 18, 19, 20, right? And don't forget that when we say the voting age is 18, it's not actually 18 because we only have elections once every four years. The chance of you <coughs> voting when you're 18 is only 25%. You're just as likely to have your first chance when you're 19, 20, or 21. Those are years when you're either at college or at university, or you've started a new job. I didn't go to university, I went straight to, to work. <coughs> But you might not be living at home. You might even be out of town. You might be on some campus in some town that you have no connection to. You didn't grow up there. You don't know the neighborhood. You're in London, you're in Hamilton, you're in Montreal, Kingston, Peterborough, who knows? Um, you're not on the voters list. Your parents aren't around. You're crazy stressed about school, right? Um, you might even be a little homesick. You've got tons of peer pressures around you. You've got alcohol, parties, hormones. Like you're in a crazy intense state. It's the worst time you could ever ask people to start voting, right? The chance that you're gonna go off and find this voting booth at some church you've never heard of in a neighborhood you don't know about because Elections Canada doesn't does, does a really poor job of doing polling stations on campus. Your parents sure aren't taking you. It's just like you've now gone from like close to 100% chance of voting to pretty much close to zero. Honestly, maybe 5%. Campus kids just don't vote and high school kids do. In fact, Tacoma Park, see, here's where you have to have like pieces of data on the tip of your tongue. Tacoma Park in Maryland was the first American city to lower the voting age to 16. And they did it there municipally before they did it state or federal. And that lowest demographic of 16 and 17 year olds voted in a higher percentage than any other age group. They voted in higher numbers than their parents. Whereas in Canada, the lowest voting turnout group is the 18 to 21 because they're off at university. So that's actually a really encouraging thing. Sorry, it's a really uh, persuasive argument because you could tell someone even, you know what, you know what, mom? Even if you don't think 16 year olds are ready, if it increases the chance that they're gonna vote when they're 30 and 40, isn't that worth it in and of itself? Um, all right, I love the little chit chat happening here. So if you go to vote16canada.org, we have a whole list of the arguments. Why, why, oh my kid, he just keep texting me, texting me, which is great. Some 16 year olds don't text their parents often. I found the trick to connect with your teenagers to just start a business with them. So we talk every day about our business. It's really cool. And he's making money. Um, okay, I wanna talk about voting systems for a second. This is really important. This is a topic I can talk about for hours. I'm gonna try and just do a really quick rundown on this. And this is important because, again, like I said before, whatever issues you're passionate about, whether it's social justice issues, economic issues, climate change, it all comes down to what policies we make as a society. And those policies are influenced by who's at the decision-making table and how they got there. There are different kinds of voting systems and some of them are way better than others. And none of them are perfect. There is no perfect voting system. This has actually been mathematically proven. It's called Arrow's theorem. Every voting system has like a scenario in which, in, in, in which way um, um, it, it can fail. It can like distort the results or create disincentives to run or to vote strategically, whatever. But there is one voting system that is by far the crappiest piece of crap in the universe. And it's the one that we're using. It's called first past the post. And you can tell it's crap just by the name because the name is a lie. There's no post that you have to pass in first past the post. The rule in first past the post is whoever gets the most votes wins, which sounds, you're probably thinking, well, duh, that's how any election should work. If Jen and Dave and Ali and Megan are running, then whoever gets the most votes wins. Well, no, that's actually a terrible way to do it. And I'll explain to you why really quickly. So let's say there's an election in a city of 10 people 
And the big issue that everyone's like arguing over is, do we like oranges or do we like carrots? So they at least agree on the color, but they're really torn about, you know, fruits or veggies. And let's say that six of them, let's see if this works. I'm just gonna tilt my screen. Six of them love oranges. This is like one of those cooking shows where the camera's on the top. We like do some spices. So six oranges, uh, six of the people are like, we want orange, woo, woo, woo. And four of them are like, we like carrots, even though these carrots are really like, what? This one looks like a snowman or something. Anyway, six like really crappy carrots. I think the soil was too, there was too much clay in the soil. So yeah, if you have two candidates or, two, you know, just like if there's an orange party and a carrot party, then like orange party wins six and carrot wins four. And that's, that's absolutely fine. The person with the most votes wins. But let's just take another bowl here. What happens if two people run for mayor who both love oranges and another person runs for, for carrots? So what happens is I'm like, vote for me. And they're like, okay, three of us, three of the oranges go in here. And this guy's like, vote for me, I love oranges. So three go in here. And this guy's like, vote for me, I love carrots. So now we say whoever has the most votes wins. Well, it's the carrot guy. Now carrot guy is the winner even though most people wanted oranges. That's called vote splitting. And that was a really simple demonstration, but essentially you can have a situation where let's say there's a, a party, let's just say they're called the Conservative Party of Ontario, for example. And then like most people in the province are like, well, we don't like you and they don't vote for them. And the conservatives um, get rejected by a majority of voters, but then they win the election anyways with the majority government. That's crazy. And that goes, same thing goes for liberals and the NDP. They all win fake majority governments all the time. This only happens in really backwards medieval countries like Canada, um, because most modern Western countries don't use first past the post. They don't allow people to use a system that gives you a bunch of like crappy carrots when what you really wanted was an orange. But the other thing is that modern voting systems that are all proportional or semi-proportional, they end up electing more women, they elect more diversity, they'll elect more people from marginalized groups like indigenous communities, people with disabilities, people of color. Um, they also lead to more civility, more collaboration. Um, so Finland right now, for example, has five parties working together in a coalition government, and they're all led by women, all five parties. So you have five female party leaders collaborating together, which is like unfathomable in Canada, where it's always like three dudes who hate each other and won't talk to each other. Um, literally, I think as of, oh no, there's one female premier now, but I think all of our premiers were male for the last like two or three years. Most mayors are male, by the way, the degree to which we elect kids, like sons of former politicians is crazy. And it's always sons, it's not daughters. I researched this for my book. So the number of, of, of men who have sat in the House of Commons at the same time as one of their own brothers was like 117. And the number of MPs who've sat in the House of Commons with a sister was zero. All of this stuff is influenced by voting systems. Because what happens here, let me just go back to the orange thing for a second and the carrots. And I'm going to wrap up because, um, because I'm supposed to. So what happens here is when we just had two candidates, orange is going to win because all six orange votes are together. When this person comes in, her name's Sally. She's like, I want to run too for oranges. And everyone sees what's going to happen. These votes are going to split and carrots are going to win. They all tell Sally, no, 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 no. You can't run. Oh no! And then she she doesn't run. She she like backs out of the race because people tell her you're going to be a spoiler. You're going to be a vote splitter. You're going to ruin everything. So different types of voting systems they don't just change how we count the votes on election night. They literally change who can run, how they run, how they campaign, um, and then how people vote. It just changes the whole thing. So I do want to mention one thing. London Leeds. This is a report that I wrote. Jen, can you type londonleeds.ca into the chat? So I wrote a report. Check it out, londonleeds.ca. 
London City Council two years ago became the first government anywhere in Canada to ditch first past the post. And when they did it, they elected their first female black councillor ever, who is now was actually just recently elected as a member of parliament. Um, they switched to a ranked ballot, which is a really cool way to run local elections. All the parties use ranked ballots to elect their own leaders. Um, Doug Ford banned ranked ballots last year, which was funny because his party elected him with the ranked ballot. Anyways, um, great example of how a small group of people started to organize locally and we actually convinced the city council to revolutionize their voting system and switch to a system that was more inclusive and more friendly and easier for people to participate. Um, so these are things you can do locally in Collingwood. Take a look at that page that I was showing before that shows all your counselors and your mayor and try to figure out which one has the nicest smile and invite them out for coffee. And tell them that you're concerned about whatever it is you're concerned about. Is it plastic waste? Is it um, the gap, the, the uh, wealth um, income gap between the genders? Is it, I don't know what it is. That's for you to figure out. You're, you have to find out what is your passion? What issue drives you? But then don't just complain about it. Don't just go out and protest about it. Meet with politicians, talk to them, try and find a policy that you can show that someone else has been doing it. I wouldn't have fought for ranked ballots if I didn't know that Minneapolis and San Francisco and Maine and the uh, presidential elections in France had all switched to ranked ballots. That's how I got London to do it. And I wouldn't be advocating for lower voting age unless I knew that Argentina and Brazil and you know um, Scotland had, had already switched. So what you wanna do is find a policy that someone's already done in another municipality, anywhere in the world, and then bring it to your counselors and say, what do you think about this? Would you put forward a motion to lower the voting age or to do whatever? And you'd be surprised. You won't win right away. It can take years sometimes, but it's crazy fun. Find other people who wanna work with you and then you have to find a way to allow yourself to be fueled by anger and excitement at the same time and do it with a smile. It's really hard, but we all have anger in us because we look at the world and we look at poverty and we look at pollution and we're like, oh, this makes me so mad. But if you try and meet with a counselor and you're just mad, they won't wanna meet with you again. <laughs> So it's learning how to like channel your anger into constructive um, and enjoyable activism. And you can, you can do anything, you can change the world, you really can. So that's it. I can take questions now or feel free to get in touch with me anytime. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. You can just Google me, I'm very accessible. My cell phone number is lying around somewhere. I'm so glad I had the chance to speak to you guys for an hour. I wish it had been face to face, um, but good luck with everything you're doing. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Dave. Um, again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, before we finish tonight, I have a couple of important announcements to make. Um, for our audience, Dave's book, Tear Down, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up is available in the Collingwood Public Libraries collection. So make sure you go place your holds or at the very least sign up for a library card and unlock all of the incredible free opportunities that are available to residents and a small fee for non-residents. Um, for all of your information, a recording of this event will be posted to um, Fifth Street's website, but also the Collingwood Public Library and Collingwood Youth Center's YouTube pages. Um, we do have two other events to follow Dave's event, and this is part of Fifth Street's Literacy Live series. So our next event is with local filmmaker, photographer, and activist John, John Cardillo. Um, and that event is coming up on November 30th at 4 p.m. Um, the Collingwood Youth Center, thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, nice dance moves. Um, but they've launched a new youth council that will look to make positive change in Collingwood and the surrounding area. Members will receive dinner and snacks at every meeting, plus an honorarium at the end of May. 
their first place, or sorry, their first meeting is taking place tomorrow. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns about the new youth council, you can email Lee at calling Lee at CollingwoodYouthCenter.ca or just pop into the youth center Monday to Friday from 3 to 8.30 p.m. to chat with some of their staff. Um, I'd also like to give a final shout out to the town of Collingwood and Experience Simcoe for funding this initiative. Without their support and the support of the Collingwood Public Library and the Collingwood Youth Center, uh, we wouldn't be here tonight. So thanks again to Dave and everyone who tuned in uh, and have a great evening. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>